Yeah, that was a heartbreaking loss. I don't think there's any way around it. Sam Ellinger played, I think, pretty good football for you uh, in his first career start, and you've got a two-score lead in your own building five minutes ago in the game, and you blow it. And that is uh, that's excruciating for a team that has not had a whole lot of leads this year. Certainly not had a lot of second half leads, let alone two possession leads. That one is in the stinging category, and I would assume Jim Irsay is not too pleased with a loss uh, to that team against the backup quarterback Daniel Snyder, Carson Wentz, all of Jim's former greats in the building, etc. You almost feel like Ellinger deserved a win too, with how well. He played, really, for long, long stretches. I'm Kevin Bowen, back another edition of Kevin's Corner. Eddie Garrison is with us, as always. Um, You know, Eddie, we're now eight games into it. I just don't think any loss has rivaled that one. Just multiple score lead. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not like the Colts played exceptionally well by any means, but I almost felt like when they went up 16-7 and that clock just started to tick and tick and tick, I'm like, man, the Colts are going to win this football game, and like they might win it by a couple scores here, uh, and nobody. For a team that hasn't been in many opportunities to finish, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that they couldn't finish. Right. Uh, and, I mean, you go up 17-6, feeling really good, or seventeen or 16-7. 16, 16, yeah. Uh, I got my numbers backwards for a second. But you go up 16-7, you're feeling really good because your defense is playing lights out. Other than that one drive where they gave up, what, three plays that were just big straight chunk plays, one after one after one. Uh, And the next thing you know, it's a one-possession game. And then you're punting on fourth down. And uh, now you're you're worried. You're like, can they come away with the stop? You get get the commanders in the third down. Uh, Yannick Ngakwe has pretty much almost a free rush on Taylor Heineke. And can't even put an arm on him. Uh, Heineke escapes and gets the first down, and then uh, the rest is history. Yeah, it was a great ball by Heineke to Curtis Samuel on the fourth and one earlier in that drive. Or I should, you know, we rolled out to his right and made a play. I think he found was it Samuel on both the fourth downs. Yeah, he found Samuel on the earlier fourth down in the fourth quarter. You know, I, I just kind of walked out of Lucas Oil Stadium thinking to myself, if you're a good football team, hell, if you're a mediocre football team, you find a way to win that game. And one play, Eddie. One play. They had two fourth downs, Washington. The McLaurin catch versus the Pittman drop. Um, like you said, punting it away in a situation where you were probably a half yard away from the first down. You know, if you sneak that at that moment, you could potentially ice the game there. You add all of that up. And if this season was going to mean anything, I just think you have the ability to find a way to do it. It's not like Washington's a good football team. Um, did Heineke keep some plays alive? Sure. But, you know, Mathis and Freeney in the building, your pass rush can't close. Offensively, you know, so many of those icons in the building, and you can't make that one play to s- sustain the drop. You know, you can close the game offensively. You can close the game with multiple first downs. You can close it on either side of the ball, and you didn't do it. Obviously, the turnovers – by Ellinger and Taylor were huge, huge. I mean, you had six drives, Eddie, reach Washington. I think it was Washington's 28-yard line, and those six drives equaled three field goals, two fumbles, and one touchdown. You know, that's just been the story way too often this season. You've moved it decently, but it feels like, especially when you get onto that side of the field, um, you just puke everywhere. And the Colts did that. Again, Ellinger, I thought, um, was pretty good. That fumble was critical. And then Taylor, that's the second time this year in Lucas Oil Stadium in the, in the second half. He's had a critical fumble there. That's halted the drive. So 3-4-1, and one, Tennessee wins. So the gap in the AFC South continues. It's almost like the AFC South, the Colts, Jags, and Texans should send their best players to Tennessee. <laughs> Try and support them. Yeah. Is that a dumb idea? I don't think so. Uh, how about Terry McLaurin's play? Oh, my. Like, just for a second here, we won't focus it on too long, but just for a second, imagine being him and making that play in that moment. You're a season ticket member with your dad growing up. You're going, you know, Section 540, and 
You're dressing up as Marvin Harrison for Halloween. Marvin's in the building. Marvin comes up to you pregame and introduces himself. They, they get a picture on the field pregame. He's been in that stadium for Big Ten championships. He's been in that stadium for state championships. This is probably the only time that there's a good chance that this is the only time he'll play in Lucas Oil Stadium his career. Maybe. If, if he stays with Washington, it's once every eight years. So he's got to play, what, until, you know, eight more years after this. And he makes that play at that moment. Um, gosh, what a play by him. And I don't blame him one bit for reacting the way he did. This is my, I don't know if he threw an expletive in there. I would if I were him. I could have, I thought he was saying, this is my blank. And not, 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 this is my city. Oh, this is my SH? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Didn't Old Depot say that one time? I think too? so. The old debate of SH, hold your tongue and say ship or city. Uh, that's where we're at right now. Hell of a play. I've said it before. I think Michael Pittman's a number one. Michael Pittman did not make a number one play. Terry McLaurin did. Yeah, he, not a not a good look for Pittman no, after. Uh, nope, nope. You, you, I didn't think he ran his mouth, but he opened his mouth last week. Yeah. Ellinger throws one of his best balls of the day, arguably his best, and you have that drop there. So just an inability to finish in the NFL. It's so much about that. So much about it. You know that Manning era. It's not like they were blowing teams out. You know, it's not like every game was a twenty-point win. You had one-possession games, and you got to find ways to get it done. So, again, I think the Colts should be open to selling in the next twenty-four to thirty-six hours. Uh, if this podcast has any clout, they'll probably make a trade at like noon once we post this pod. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll see on Wednesday's pod what, what happens there. But anything else, Eddie? Overall, Matt Hawk, nice job. Um, nice response. Yeah. Nice response. He was horrific last week. Really good yesterday. Some individuals I thought stepped up we can touch on as well. That was a Paris Campbell, Ohio State type game for me. Um, I do want to hit on that. I think we have some Twitter questions about Paris. But anything else overall before we get into what I didn't like? I mean, we always talk about the NFL in close games, it comes down to a handful of plays, three to five plays. And you look at those three to five plays, it's the fumble by Sam Ellinger in the red zone, the fumble by Jonathan Taylor in the red zone. Uh, the fourth and one uh, conversion to Curtis Samuel, the drop uh, from Michael Pittman Jr. that would have put the Colts around midfield with about 15 seconds to go. I mean, those right there are the four plays that decided that game. You know, I always like to go back and look at an under-the-radar play. Um, full transparency, I haven't really given it much thought until right now. There was a third and three there in the third quarter I'm looking at where they just ran Taylor straight up the gut. Yeah. Like... I- Again, get Ellinger out of the pocket. That you know, I actually did think. I mean, uh, trust me, we'll we'll get to Frank Reich. I did think Reich did a lot of good things yesterday, and getting guys like Campbell and and Hines in space a little bit more. Um, I thought the RPO game was decent. I felt like you could have got Ellinger a little bit more out of the pocket. You know, if you convert there, that would have been a big moment. Obviously, the turnovers aren't under the radar plays, but they were huge. Uh, the Boo Birds were out a little bit too. Uh, Lucas Oil Stadium yesterday. Yeah, um, and I'll bl- you know I thought the fan base had some venom earlier, early on uh, in that Jacksonville game. I agree. I mean, shit, man, it's ten straight games without a halftime lead. I mean, that's got to rank up there. I was looking at Ch- Chap and I, my Chap and I sit, sit next to each other. I go, Chap, it's got to be a record. We, we we tried to look it up. We we didn't have a whole lot of luck with it. But I mean, when you think about if I'm Jim Irsay right now, I'm sitting here thinking. My GM believes in the O-line like I believe in Bruce Springsteen name drops in the Ring of Honor Woo-hoo. ceremony. Yeah. And that's that's my O-line product right now? That's what it is? That would be something that would keep me up at night. The other thing would be I've got an offensive-minded head coach. And let's just start with the head coach title. And we haven't had a halftime lead in 10 straight games. Like, bad football teams are find a fluky, hey, they're up 10-6 at halftime. We could have an upset here, Bruin. And then, you know, water finds low. The Colts even ha- haven't even had one of those. Yeah. And then from a play-calling Frank Reich standpoint, you continue to... It, it, it's like a dream if they score 20 points. They should stop the game and, you know, give the game ball to Frank Reich if his, if his offense can score 20. Because that's where you're at. Outside of the Jacksonville game, you've done it one... That's it. That's the only time you've done it. Since that Christmas game. Um, Who was it after the game that said something? He said, at this point, it's not on the defense anymore. It's on the offense. Like, we have to got to start scoring 20 a game. 
Yeah, I would guess was it like Pierce? Hines or Kelly. I, I don't know. Maybe it was Pierce. Pierce seems a little too quiet for him to say that. I mean, they are right. And it goes back to the Jim Mercer, you know, tweet during the playoffs last year of you've got to be able to, I mean, he said got to be able to score 30 yeah. in regulation, have a quarterback. I mean, right now you're not even sniffing that. And it's just they get into the scoring range and then all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. Um, and we saw it yesterday. So uh, last thing to note before I get into what I didn't like, um, saw this from some people that cover the Commanders. And I feel like this happens way too often with the Colts, these historical notes. Did you see this, Eddie? No. The Commanders yesterday, and coming back from two scores down in the final five minutes, they had lost, dating back to 2000, they had been in that situation 129 times. Down two scores, five minutes to go in the game. They had lost 128 of the 129 moments. Oh, my word. I feel like those like historical notes happened way too often with the Colts. Way too often. Yep. Individually, team-wise, however you slice it up. And I know Jim Irsay, you know, tried to control the narrative yesterday morning by calling all his national folks and trying to put some water on the old fire. Um, that's my opinion on the situation. Being safe on October 30th is not being safe on January 13th. And again, this one was circled a little bit more than most on Ursay's calendar. Yes, Wentz was not in our center, but Daniel Snyder, I thought Daniel Snyder bought that hooded sweatshirt like at the at the commander's gift shop. Um, uh-huh. Did he think the Colts were playing outdoors? I'm not sure why he was rocking that, but nonetheless, his football team got the win. A uh, couple final things here before we transition to what you didn't like. Yes, it was Alec Pierce. Uh, he was asked about what it was like watching the final drive and ultimately knowing uh, that this is a 3-4-1 and one football team. And his response was, we just got to do a better job. The defense has bailed us out all season, uh, and we have to do a better job. We've put, we've got to put more points on the board. we got to start scoring 20 points at least. Pierce? Yes. Man, good for the Rook. Um, and then... He's doing his part. Commanders uh, were 0-5 for 5 in the second half on third down. Didn't convert a single third down, and somehow uh, the Colts lose the game. So while we dive into the first thing that you didn't like, Kevin, uh, costly turnovers. We've already kind of hinted at it with uh, Sam Ellinger and Jonathan Taylor uh, both fumbling in the red zone area. Yeah, Eddie, 21 fumbles on the year. and I think I've mentioned this here leading into yesterday. The Colts have honestly been pretty lucky with their fumbles. They've frequently recovered them. Yesterday, they did not recover the Ellinger one or the Taylor one. Um, so instead of, you know, think about it, if you pounce on either of those balls, you probably still kick a field goal on those drives. Um, six points, you couldn't have used six points at the end of the game. Um, this offense just isn't good enough to turn the football over like that or have drives halt. It, it's, it's not potent enough. Uh, it's not good enough. However you want to slice and dice it. Um, and those two were just so, so crippling and just dejecting and the feeling on that. So I know I harped a lot on the end-of-game situations at the start, and I get that those plays are scrutinized, but I think you got to start with those two turnovers. And like I said, the six drives that got you know almost to Washington's red zone – and you score one touchdown total. You don't score a touchdown until the fourth quarter. But, you know, Chase McLaughlin has been a kicker that, albeit some of those things aren't the prettiest looking things, they go in. And you just got to get to fourth down. I said it earlier. Matt Ryan, you just got to punt. <laughs> you know, you, uh, a punt is a good thing for this football team Yeah. at one point in the season. With Ellinger entering the game, it was don't make bad plays worse. And I felt like if we were going to see an Ellinger turnover, I thought it was more likely we'd see it Houdini type thing than it would mental mistake. And like I at think the we, end of the game, right? And I think we saw it on that play, and you know, he just kind of dropped that. You know, trying to scramble, trying to make a play. And I think any time, you know, I don't know if he was trying to put two hands on the ball or if he was going to transfer hands in that situation. Just a huge, huge turnover. And then Taylor, of course, that was a great hit, but. Um, yeah, that was a uh, that was a big play as well. 
Uh, the other thing you didn't like was the inability to finish uh, both offensively and defensively. Let's start with the offense. Yeah, I, again, Eddie, I think so many times – let me fire off this quick text. Um, so many times we think about finishing you know, with your defense. Um, but I think you can point to both sides of the ball in that situation – and you didn't sustain drives, uh, and then obviously you had some pass rush situations you didn't capitalize on. I'm pretty sure Heineke only had two incompletions in on those final two drives. So you go up 16-7, you get them into that third and long, they find McKissick for seven. How good was that ball by Heineke to Curtis Samuel mm-hmm. on the fourth and six? Kenny Moore gets beat there out of the slot. And then... Um, they kick a field goal. You get the drive back. You know, Frank Reich talked about that second down right before the Ellinger scramble, which they challenged. That was an RPO that they really liked, and Ellinger decided to give it to Taylor in that moment. Um, on third down, I, again, I would have liked to have seen just kind of a natural rollout there, you know, force Ellinger out of the pocket. Um, I know he scrambled and he almost got it, but that was still kind of a chaotic scramble there. Um Again, I, I, hindsight is twenty twenty, but I I said to Mike Chappell, I would have snuck it on fourth and inches. I would have gone for it there. I mean, what is the QB sneak success rate in the NFL? It's got to be over 80%. Well, that's the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> I, I mean, it's got to be absurdly high. And Ellinger, you know, Frank says after the game, well, Ellinger hasn't, you know, we didn't have a chance to do that in practice. All right. How much do you need to practice a quarterback sneak? Exactly. Sam Ellinger is one of the most instinctual football players on your roster. You don't think the man's ever ran a QB sneak? Especially at Texas? I think he can handle it. Hell, call a timeout and get Ellinger and Ryan Kelly on the sideline and practice it. You know, Put a wall up of <laughs> Colts practice squad guys and, and practice taking a handoff and doing a QB sneak. Because obviously Ellinger was in the shotgun a whole lot. And I get it. Your defense had been playing well, and it's a backup quarterback, and ultimately they're defending 89 yards and all of that. I, all of that makes sense. But I just felt like that was a moment where you can go and try and win the game with the ball. Go win it. And you did not win it in that moment there. And then obviously, you know, Heineke has the fourth and one. He converts to Samuel. Uh, the big play to Terry McLaurin. You know, Gilmore has an opportunity to end it. The Pittman drop. I mean, there's seven or eight plays you can point to. Yep. And that gets back to the the Colts have not put themselves in enough of these positions this year to kind of get used to it or know how to react to it. I almost just seem like they were hoping to get to triple zeros. Hoping to get to triple zeros. And Washington had a little more sense of urgency. And probably some of that, honestly, is Heineke's experience. You know, I'm not going to pretend to watch Washington on a frequent basis, but it seems like Heineke's done a couple of these things. And so maybe over time, there's a little bit of a culture where you're like, hey, we can go win this game at this point. Um, but no finishing whatsoever by the Colts. Um, when I was looking at the, when I was watching some of the game, um, I was just kind of like shaking my head with some of the play calling in like crucial situations. Uh, you alluded to that third down and three earlier in the pod. They go to JT, and uh, Taylor doesn't get a yard. No gain. You settle for a 39-yard field goal. Um, with the fourth down and one or the fourth down in inches, here's the way I look at it. I look at it from both sides. I look at it your way, Kev. It's like, okay, yes, they should have gone for it. Quarterback sneak. I don't like people going in the shotgun and goal-to-go situations when you're that close. The second part of me is you look at the Kansas City Chiefs and how Patrick Mahomes is pretty much in the shotgun anytime they're near the goal line, and you can do so many things out of the shotgun. You've got a mobile quarterback, so you can he can make an easier read if he hands it off to Jonathan or Naheem, and then, or he can run for the touchdown. So you've got some different avenues there in the shotgun when you have a mobile quarterback versus when you're under center. Because if you're under center, it's more than likely going to be a run play or a play action pass that you can cater towards. Um, the second part of the goal to go situation for me is how many of these teams nowadays, Kev, have you watched games and it's inches and they put the quarterback under center and they bring the tight end in motion. Right, and just pushes them. Push them from yep. behind. Uh-huh. Notre Dame's doing a thing right now 
where they're literally bringing their tight end in motion. Drew, Drew Pine's in the shotgun. Yeah. Drew Pine, by the way, he couldn't start for you know, Short Ridge High School here locally. Anyways, Drew Pine's in shotgun. The tight end literally comes in motion, and then he goes under center. The tight end takes a snap, and Michael Mayer then pushes Mitchell Evans for the first down. Like, I, it's, it's such a shame, Eddie, that, like, we're having these discussions twofold. One, that you're not doing those sorts of things. And two, you don't trust your own line in short yardage. Yep. With all that's invested in that group, the sixth overall pick at left guard, the 18th overall pick at center, and you feel like you've got to punt the ball away. Like that, that to me is just such an indictment of your operation right now. And again, the biggest core belief for Chris Ballard in that you don't feel like you can go win the game in that moment. That to me is just, oh man. And again, there's been moments where you've been flat out stuffed this year trying to get the ball to Taylor. So I understand why there's hesitancy. I just can't believe that this is where you're at right now. It's like the O-line finds a new way to disappoint you on a weekly basis. Uh, The second part of that, either if you don't go for the quarterback sneak, the tallest cornerback for Washington is 6'1". You have Jelani Woods, you have Moali Cox, Michael Pittman, and Alec Pierce. You're telling me none of those guys who are taller than their tallest cornerback cannot win a 50-50 ball if you just throw it up in the air? Boy, how quiet were your tight ends yesterday? Uh, Kylan Gransom is the only one I think that even had a target. Or, well... Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Well, Mo might have had one. Mo had one. Nothing for Jelani Woods. Mo, I think Mo's played like 115-some snaps in the last four games. Two targets and one catch. All right, final thing before we get to what you liked. I texted this to you last night, something I wanted to talk about. Uh, the screen game and the decision on who is receiving the screen. You're the, We saw in the preseason, uh, Jonathan. Ta- I don't know if Jonathan Taylor got one or not, but Pittman was getting screens in the passing game. I don't think he's even had one this year in the regular season. It's pretty much been Paris Campbell and Kylan Granson as the two recipients of the wide receiver screen or just a, a pass catcher screen. Um, what are your thoughts about that, and is it a little concerning to you? Yeah, I feel like you have just been really poor, especially in blocking on those screens. I think Pittman's got a few. I just don't think you've blocked it very well. Yeah. Um, you know, yesterday, the big play to Campbell, right? I think Dennis Kelly did a great job of getting out on the perimeter, a huge block to spark Campbell on that one. Um, you know, I understand why the Colts want to run it. They have guys that they feel like are difficult to tackle. They've got big guys, to your point. You've got a speed guy in, in Campbell. Um, I think another area where you've just struggled is you miss Zach Pascal and Jack Doyle oh, blocking. Yeah. You know, I, I know Pascal scored yesterday for the Eagles, but I, w- I think you miss them in those moments. And, you know, I said this at the start of the year about the tight end group. who They've had some flashes this year. Yeah. But I think you will miss the boringness of Jack Doyle. You will miss the 4 for 46 or 4 for 32 in a game, but yet two of those four catches were on third and fours, and they kept drives alive. And Jack Doyle just knew where to be, knew timing, walling off a defender, making a play, sure-handed. Right now, Eddie, you don't have that out of the tight end group. No yeah. one is, no one does boring well in that group. Flashes, but the consistency of week in and week out, that's one of the hardest things to do, I think, for anybody in the NFL, is can you be repeatable? Um, can you continue to do it week in and w- week out? And I think that young group, you're starting to see some struggles there. Um, so, yeah, the screen game, gosh, in Washington – they made some big play. Colts had some issues early on, and like flat recognition. I feel yeah. like Gibson like had plenty of room to run with a few of those dump offs there. Um, so yeah. Uh, last thing here, uh, I was talking to Eddie White. Oh boy, about we were just talking about the Colts. Um, I mean, we were just talking off air because it was obviously after our Pacer win, so we're not going to talk Colts during that time. But like, he was just talking about like it's amazing how. Tampa Bay Buccaneers miss Rob Gronkowski so much and how the Indianapolis Colts miss Jack Doyle so much. Like He's like, it's Jack freaking Doyle. It's not like it's a Hall of Fame tight end. It's just a guy that went out there. He didn't care about being sexy. He would go out there, do his job, took pride in doing his job, knew he did it damn well, and the Colts just 
simply did not address uh, filling his void or lack for, or not really want. I don't really want to say for lack of a better phrase, but like not realizing how much they were losing when they lost Jack Doyle. Yeah, I think internally, especially with Frank Reich, I think he knew it. That's why I was a little surprised. You had a couple veteran tight ends in free agency that I thought it'd be wise to go after. Um, again, you, you've had the flashes from particularly Woods and Granson, probably more than Mo this season, but it's just a consistency of it's an offense that is struggling to sustain drives, sustain drives in the they, they're so reliant on these 10 players. That's difficult to do. 10 play drives is what I'm saying there. Um, and I think just having a consistent presence at tight end would help you in that area. Uh, All right. Is that everything in what I didn't like? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what you did like, I think uh, a lot of fans should also like Sam Ellinger. Uh, very solid. Did not throw in the interception. He did have the one fumble. Other than that, though, uh, pretty clean football game from Sam. You know, honestly, Eddie, it's pretty much what I thought we'd see out of him. So many people ask me over the week, how do you think he's going to do? How do you think he's going to do? I'm like, I really don't think he will piss down his leg. I think I don't think we'll see deer in headlights. I think he will acquit himself fine. My biggest question, and he had several answers to this, was what would he look like as a vertical passer when those opportunities arose? I thought he was pretty willing. And pick your favorite ball. The one to Pierce? The one to Pittman that Pittman dropped, the Campbell ball that drew the big pass interference penalty, the touch pass to Hines, kind of over the shoulder. I mean, all of those, Eddie, were some Sunday big league throws that he will have to continue to check off. Um, You know, what the Colts just did not do at all last week in Nashville was they just didn't test anything vertically. Yeah. Like I am such a believer that you have got to take shots down the field just to send a message at times. Just to tell safeties you can't cheat like that. Or corners, you can't bump all day long because we are going to take some chances. And I think what we're seeing, particularly with Pierce, is Eddie, when you throw those balls down the field to Pierce, I thought he should have drawn another flag yesterday. In the first half. Yeah. I mean, was it was it uncatchable? <laughs> I, I I don't know. I but I think that's the part of Ellinger's game yesterday that has me thinking really good work from Sam. You know, I've said it all along with him. High-end backup, spot starter that can give you an opportunity to win a football game. I think you saw that from him yesterday in his first start. Yeah. That's pretty darn good. But a few more Sunday throws that I was like, okay, nice. This is, you know, I, I still have questions about velocity and things like that. And it's definitely not, and Frank would tell you this, it's not at the peak level that you would want. Um, I also sat there and watched Ellinger yesterday and thought, in no way, shape, or form does this change how I view quarterback in next year's draft. And, you know, for that, any sort of small sample size of one game, you probably shouldn't make anything um, too concrete on that. Um, Final stats for Ellinger, 17-23, 201 yards, got sacked twice. Uh I was surprised to see he didn't really run much. It was a 6 for 15, is that right? Yeah, 6 for 15, yeah. I felt like that doesn't do it justice on what his legs did. There were back-to-back third down play, or there's a third down and then a first down on the Colts' first scoring drive of the game uh, when Chase McLaughlin kicked the field goal early second quarter. Um, So I guess this would have been late first quarter when Ellinger did this. He had a third and four. At that point, the Colts Colts had gone three and out, three and out. The third and four, Ellinger rolls to his left and finds Pittman for 10. That is his legs finding Pittman in that moment. And then on the very next play, on a first down, he finds Pittman for 16. And I thought that kind of got everything rolling. Later in the drive, Taylor had the 27-yarder. That was a run-pass option. If you watch that, Ellinger's presence freezes that that uh, left defensive end for Washington. Taylor's up the gut and in the open field for 27. I just thought you saw his leg. His legs don't always show up in the box score, but if you watch the game, you notice it. And I've said this for years now, and I will continue to say it, and I hope the Colts are starting to see this, because I've been curious if Chris Bauer and Frank Reich believe this, if they are indeed the ones making the decision next next offseason on this, which remains to be seen. 
you got to have a leg element in your quarterback. Oh, yes. You have to. You have to. You put your offense at such a disadvantage if you don't. And I get it. At some point, do you have to deliver from the pocket? Yeah. I mean, there are elements of any game that you got to deliver from from the pocket. But if your QB, and I'm not talking your QB's got to be Lamar Jackson or or Josh Allen, but just what Ellinger showed yesterday is you can just spark some things with subtle movements in the pocket, getting out on the perimeter. Uh, I really liked Eddie how he responded from the fumble. Yes, I wasn't too surprised by it, but. I mean, that was a fumble where he literally just dropped the ball. It's not like Montez Sweat got it from the backside and it was a hell of a play. That was just Ellinger dropping the ball. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if I'm grading him on a 1-10 to 10 scale, I'm probably giving him a nice 8. And those yeah. throws were big. I mean, if you want to talk bad, I mean, he should have had the one that should have been picked off early. I think there was that one miscommunication, kind of a jail break. He got sacked in the red zone. Obviously, the turnover was bad. Um and now the question becomes this. How much of that was a jolt for a week? And now it's, you got to do it on the road. You got to do it against Belichick. In Foxborough. In Foxborough. We'll see what the what the weather's going to be like. And who's starting for New England, too? Uh, you know, n- no touchdowns in the first three quarters. Again, you're going to have to be a little bit more potent. But I thought, in my Sam Ellinger expectations, he pretty much checked the box. And again, I'd give it a little bit more because of I can count three or four, 15 to longer throws through the air that Ellinger gave his guys chances to make plays. As much as we, uh, you know, criticize Frank Reich and the play calling, I thought Frank did a really good job at getting Sam out of the pocket and getting him moving with bootlegs early on to get him comfortable and into that groove because we saw it in the preseason that we talked about it last week. A couple of those big plays that he made in the preseason that were like, whoa, were when he was moving out outside the pocket and throwing on the run. I thought he looked really good when he did that. I'm interested to see if that's a part of the offense that will develop as the season progresses because obviously the playbook was c- catered to Matt Ryan and now you have to try and cater it to Sam Ellinger and if you can include more motion to help Ellinger identify things pre-snap it's only going to make Sam better and make this offense better yeah I would like to see a little bit more of it um him out of the pocket him you know moving the pot I mean there's some bootleg opportunities I think that you can get get to um you are right Eddie they did try to do some of that stuff early I like that Hines and Taylor were in the backfield for yes. a couple of those snaps that's a lot of variety you can do off of that Washington honestly executed pretty well in in some of those situations and scenarios to make sure that they're that they are um they were accounting for everybody but there is a different part of the playbook that's more open with Ellinger and you know Frank Wright definitely had some issues yesterday but I also thought he tapped into some of the perimeter stuff that's necessary like when you have a running quarterback like, like that you need to make sure that you are Forcing the defense to defend east to west, and I thought they did a nice job with Campbell and Hines on the perimeter in those situations. You know, they had Campbell go in motion a few times early on, didn't give it to him, and then boom, gave it to him on the jet sweep, and that was a huge, huge play. Um, Final thing that uh, we should probably hit up before we get to Twitter question that you like some individual defenders. I thought Kenny Moore, outside of that fourth down conversion that he gave up to uh, Curtis Samuel, I thought he had a solid game. And I know people wanted to bring up the Kenny Moore deleted tweet. Did you see that? Yeah. Did you text me that? I did. Yeah, I thought you did not. Now you say that. Um, I I don't read too much into it as far as a trade. I read into it that Kenny Moore reads his Twitter mentions. You want me to read it out so that yeah. just in case people yeah. didn't yep. see it? Go ahead. Uh, Kenny Moore tweeted, this was at 9.04, and I think it was deleted not even five minutes after. I still love you, Wendy. I'm ride or die this way. It's only unconditional love for me, but, it, but I understand it doesn't have to go both ways. Cold world love. Kenny Moore and Shaquille Leonard are very in tune with their social media. I, I that's that's what I read into it. I don't I don't think it means trade. Um, individuals I liked: Isaiah Franklin, Eddie continues to play really really good football. Um, Grover Stewart, DeForest Buckner. As much as your O line is not living up to their contracts, Grover Stewart and DeForest Buckner, who have each signed extensions in the last whatever two to three years, they both continue to play to their contracts. 
um, Grover exceeding it without question. I don't know if you saw my tweet. Uh, we've got the Build Thy Statue campaign going for Benedict Matherin Correct. already. Yes. Uh-huh. Let's get the Build Thy Statue going for Grover Stewart. I could not agree more with that. Just uh, and You can put a chicken wing in his left hand with that <laughs> statue. Um, EJ Speed, he played eight snaps. He had three tackles. And a huge tackle for a loss in the fourth down. Oh, yes. Like, you, 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 you know, Bobby O'Karake and EJ Speed are in contract years, Eddie. Linebacker, we can get into some Twitter questions. Is that a position you look to move tomorrow? By tomorrow? That's some. That's a position group that I thought they would move. Do you have room for all of them? Right. You can either move Okereke or you could move Speed or the big one. Who had the pick? Yeah, let, let's bring up Leonard. I thought it was the full Shaquille Leonard experiment yesterday. I thought Washington attacked him on the first drive. I thought they ran it right at him. I thought they said, let's see how he responds. And I don't think he handled it very well. Um, I think he only played two series in the first half. I thought it was just one. But then he played like three in a row to start the second half. He played 24 snaps. That was the official number. 24 for him. He had the interception. Again, there is a natural knack to it. Tyquan Lewis, a great rush there. I do think he's a guy that just... He senses these things. He feels them. He just, it's hard to describe, but with that comes a little bit of the non box score stuff of like, he had two tackles on that first drive. And it's not like, you know, frankly, I didn't think he impacted much. Yeah. He impacted negatively, to be honest with you, with those two tackles there. So curious to see moving forward what's a burst look like, those things. Does he get more comfortable? All of that. Um, but, yeah, I'm interested to see see what happens. Uh, anything else you want to hit on before we get into Twitter questions? I think that covers it. I feel like Twitter questions will oh, um, round out a little everything else. Tyquan Lewis, man. I hate to see that. Absolutely hated to see that. Halloween um, weekend last year. Exactly. Patel injury against the Titans on a non-contact. This wasn't non-contact, but you know, it's not like he got rolled up on or somebody drove into his you know knee. This was just a... Kind of a pass rush situation there, um, and you see him like as soon as he like sits, pretty much motion. stops. Yeah, he's like, come out. And you, know, he's been versatile. He's been consistent. He's been productive. Those are three th- areas that's hard to find on the defensive line. And really, Dio Dengbo, while you're waiting and waiting for him, he's been the guy that's been. Pretty consistent without Quiddy Pay. He, he's playing a really high snap count as well. So, um, yeah, that that is a that's a big injury, a big injury to keep an eye on. Uh, Twitter question number one. Uh, this comes from Sean. Uh, Frank Reich said after the game that they never practiced a quarterback sneak with Sam Ellinger before uh, yesterday's game. How does this happen? How do you not prepare for as simple of a play as that which could cost them a chance at an easy touchdown on third and inches and potentially easy call to try it on fourth and inches at the end of the game? Frank didn't call a bad game yesterday, but the mistakes this team continues to make has to fall on coaching, right? Yeah, I, I don't understand that with Ellinger. Um, again, it's a shame your short yard situation has gotten to that. I mean, how about uh, Quentin Nelson whiffing on the third and goal down there, just whiffing on the block? Yikes. Again, that's happened too often th- th- this season. And really, like that last point, Frank didn't call a bad game, but the mistakes the team continues to make has to fall on coaching, right? Like Frank got some guys in space. And he got Sam, you know, to I think manage, you know, pretty reasonable game plan. But the short yarded stuff, oh man, it's just such, such an issue for this team right now. Twofold, not having trust in it to QB sneak it, and then you know when you try to run it, like actual running plays, like hand it off, you get blown up way too much there. So um, I did not like the Ellinger lack of QB sneak usage. Uh, TM says that Paris Campbell has earned a second contract, but he says nothing major, a one-year prove-it deal. Uh, the second thing is that 
uh, to assume that the worst with that Tyquan Lewis injury, with him leaving on the cart, that it's another season-ending injury um, and potentially a career-ending injury, uh, given the fact that he's never been a major difference on defense. Uh, wanted to ask you for your opinion. Yeah, well, I, l- let's start with Campbell. I think what stood out to me yesterday, Eddie, about Campbell is I saw college Paris Campbell yesterday. Yes. You know, with Matt Ryan, we saw possession receiver Campbell, which was interesting. I'm like, oh, wow, this is like you know, seven for 70, you know, like those sorts of things. What I saw yesterday was a guy that took a jet sweep and made a play with the ball in his hands. A guy that took a screen, made a play with the ball in his hands. A guy that got behind a defender and drew a big pass interference penalty. That's the stuff coming out of Ohio State that I thought we would see more and more of of high percentage touches let me make the play with the ball in my hands and I felt like that was on display yesterday and I can't really call I, I'm sure people can point out other games to me Eddie I can't really call a game that he's done it like that yeah with the jet sweep and the screen and even the big play I mean that was it he had two touches and 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 the pass interference penalty again it's not like he had seven or eight but for an offense that is so reliant on the long, long drives, the fact that you can get a little spark from him in those moments is just absolutely massive. Um, So, yeah, Campbell right now to uh, – who was that? Was it John you said? TM. TM, excuse me. Um, Definitely not John. Uh, Yeah, second contract. Nothing major, one year prove a deal, and obviously, you know, health. We're, we're we're halfway through the year, and that's something you can't entirely rule out. Um, and then you just hate it for Lewis. On the flip side of that, he's also in a contract year. Yeah. So, um, boy, you really need Dio Dangbo to step up. Uh, next one comes from Matt, and he says that he would trade Shaq Leonard and Quentin Nelson in a heartbeat. Uh, since getting paid, they have both regressed. Nelson is by far the biggest money fleece on the roster. What is your thought in hypocritical compensation uh, for each player? But I'm pretty sure uh, he meant hypothetical compensation for each player. Yeah, I um, didn't someone send in like... Yeah, that's the next question. Okay, th- th- that was kind of interesting. It's almost like we should transition into that because these they do provide some hypothetical... Um, draft compensation. Yeah, I think something to keep in mind right now. First off, when I see any question like this, and you got to think of like, what do teams value? You know, do all 32 teams view the positions like the Colts view them? Uh, I would say no. Um, And I'd be very surprised if either of these guys got traded, but um, I think no one would be untouchable on this roster. No one. Everybody's got a price. Everybody has a price in my mind. Um, the other thing I think to keep in mind here over the next, again, 24 to 36 hours, find desperate. Find desperate. Or find teams that are succeeding above their expectation. Sure. Because sure. they could be a team that is looking to be a buyer. Teams that maybe didn't expect to be in this situation. Teams that think their window's closing and they're a little bit more pressing in that mood. Um, I made the analogy earlier today. Hell, maybe one of us was it at some point in our lives. We've all been at the bar, and things have gotten a bit desperate late, <laughs> late at night. Find them. Find them, find them, find them. And, um, yeah, I, I, you, you, you have to look into it. You look at the so. NFC. You've got Dallas and New York, both 6-2. and two. Uh, Minnesota seems like they've ran away with the NFC North at this point. And it's not just division um, stuff, you know, Eddie. It's like, do you think that you – I mean, the NFC is wide open in my mind of, like, who's going to represent them? And you've got the NFC South. That is the big division I think you should be – Can you believe the Falcons? Targeting, yeah, between the Falcons, Bucks, and Saints. I think one of those three teams, if not all three, should be looking into some uh, sort of upgrades um, anywhere that they need a fit, which kind of – to transition to the next Twitter question um, from Dara – I think I'm saying that right. Yeah, from Ireland. Um, you know you're following a little bit better than I do. I believe so. Until we yeah, do, but, yeah. Uh, loyal, loyal lawyer. Uh, so I'm going to start backwards and work up. So at the end of this, uh, he says, which trades are you making? So we're going to do these one by one instead of all at once. Um, 
But he says, hi, Kevin. Question for the pod tomorrow. You are the general manager for the Indianapolis Colts and the trade deadline. The following trades uh, come through or you're offered. Which trades are you making? The first, a fifth round pick for Ryan Kelly. Are you making that or not? Yes. A fifth round pick for Kenny Moore. Um. Yeah. A fifth round pick for Naeem Hines. No. A first round pick and a fourth round pick for Shaq Leonard from the New York Giants. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. A first round pick for Jonathan Taylor from the Atlanta Falcons. Um, yeah, probably would just because I don't want to pay Taylor coming up. I think you could get more for Jonathan. Yeah. I, I'd be curious what exactly you could. I mean, I know Christian McCaffrey is a much different running back than him. And if you add up the McCaffrey trade capital, draft capital, it pretty much is a late first. Obviously, I don't know if Atlanta is actually going to be there. I mean, plus McCaffrey has those question marks with his injury history, too. Sure, sure. And it already is a big contract. Yes. Uh, final uh, trade. A first round pick and a fifth round pick for Quentin Nelson from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah. So would. which one would you uh, which one would you make all of them? I mean, hell, I'd I, I'd think about all of them. And again, first off, you're not going to be offered all this. Correct. Second off, I know this comes off as like I'm blowing it up, but. I think you just have to be open minded. And frankly, another thing I throw out there is do you does anybody want Matt Ryan or Nick Foles? I do that in a heartbeat for a day three pick. You gonna eat the contract? I do it for a seventh rounder. Uh no need to have both of them on your roster starting Wednesday. So I, I think those are all um things that I would look into of you've got guys in Kelly and Moore that you're questioning their level of play as they reach the age of thirty. Yeah. Um, Hines is a fifth rounder. I, again, I still think he's a little underutilized, and I think with Ellinger, he can be utilized even more. We saw a little bit of that yesterday. So, you know, maybe it's kind of a 10 game sample size, but I think moving forward, you know, for the most part, he's been durable. Um, so, I, I, I don't know if I'd go there. And then with Leonard and Taylor and Nelson, I, getting rid of the, of the contracts, I think, are really, really important. Um, and if all of a sudden you have a second first round pick to go with, you drafting 12th overall now can you move up a little bit more and then still have enough draft capital to support where you're at with this um would you trade to Forrest buckner you know part of me is like buckner and grover are such a great tandem keep them i think i think it's an important building block on the defense um so i i, I probably would not but again everybody's got a price uh, next question is from Joe. He says, some people are winners, some people are losers. I've come to learn that Frank Reich is just a loser. He finds a new and creative way to lose each week. We can't punch it in at the one-yard line. We don't go for it on fourth down to seal the game. We don't make winning plays. The Colts have had scapegoats in years past, but they're running out. There's been one common denominator in all of this. Frank Reich. It's time for a change. Why should we continue to go down this path uh, with this regime? What hope has the staff given you, and why not make a change? Joe, obviously extremely clear in his thoughts there. If I'm Jim Irsay, a question that I'd have for my football coach is, why do we start so poorly? Ten straight games without a halftime lead. And again, that's a scripted portion, you know? And that's when you're like, you're really reliant on your coaching staff in that moment. Mindset, urgency, guys locked in early. Um, you know, playing with kind of that hungry, like, let's play from ahead. I mean, 10 straight games. That is such a long time. And again, look at the opponents you've played in those 10 games. You've played some sorry-ass teams. Jacksonville, Houston... Jacksonville, what, three times? Go yep. back to last season? Yep. Houston, a couple. Vegas. Denver. Oof. I mean, don't tell me Washington's any good. So that is just, I think, what adds to it. Of It's not like the schedule has been some gauntlet either. And that's why, um, you know, Frank, you know, 
Frank would obviously push back on this question, and he was asked it in a little bit of a different tone <laughs> last week, and feels like they have over exceed or exceeded expectations in some areas. You know, when he references quarterback, again, you know, part of that is your guy's choice as a franchise. And I know that Frank and Chris have not totally been on the same page with that. But again, some of that is your choice as a franchise of like, you've decided to go down this path. So does that mean that we should reset expectations for you because this is what you've been, cho- like, you've chosen this and like give you built in excuses? And again, what are the expectations? No playoff wins and no division titles since you've started this train. Um, I don't think the expectations are that high when you're playing in this division. So right now, Jim Mercer has plenty of merit, plenty of merit to be highly critical, questioning the future of this franchise. Not only a head coach, in my opinion, but the general manager as well. Uh, why is Matt Pryor even playing? You can't get any more worse than him. And is Chris Ballard going to speak up and do something? He usually does a press conference, but he hasn't said anything like this team is okay from Chris. Okay, let's start with Pryor. Yeah, I mean, you've tried three guards. You're going to go back to Pinter? You're going to go back to Fries? Wesley French? <laughs> Wesley French. Makes a nice 53-man paycheck, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, he was inactive. Yesterday, right? Yeah, big holding penalty by Pryor, right? Uh, I thought it was Quinn that had the holding. Uh, or did they both have it? I think they each had one. Only three penalties yesterday for each team. Um, yeah, very quiet day on the penalty front. So, yeah, I, I uh, you know, part of me is kind of like, yeah, your fifth offensive lineman's always going to look like that. You know my thoughts, though. If you're going to be mediocre or bad, at least be bad or mediocre with the youth. Yeah. So... You know, play Pinter or Fries on that front. As far as Ballard, Ballard, I, I'd be stunned if we heard from him anytime soon. Um, he does not do an in-season press conference. I cannot recall really any time he's done one. Maybe he has, but I, I can't recall any. What he does do from an availability standpoint during the season is he usually goes on Colts, Colts Roundtable Round Live, yeah, which is the Monday night radio show for those unfamiliar with it, airs on our airwaves. It's also on the Colts Audio Network. Yeah, Colts podcast page. You can find that. Um, he usually goes on there every four weeks. Quarterly updates. Didn't do it after week four. I guess tonight would be after week eight, right? Yeah. Uh, so tonight he would go on it, but I have... And, you know, the questions are pretty controlled in that environment. Um, it's not like he's being asked, oh, what's your opinion on your head coach right now? And I totally understand it. I've, I've been there before. You've got a hand tied behind your back. Um, I would like to see him go on it. I'd be interested to see. Part of me thinks when you make such a drastic move like they did last week with Ryan, yeah, you need to hear from people above Frank Reich. Yeah, and I know Jim Irsay again try to act like everyone is on board with this. That's not true. Um, I I thought last Wednesday Frank Reich looked like a man answering questions that he didn't feel like he deserved to be answering of like guys that no this is not a collaborative approach or whatever the phrase was he used yeah on the answer um heavy 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 owner influence so i thought last week we should have or could have heard from someone above frank um my thing with the whole ryan situation if like the Colts wanted to make this move. And again, when I say Colts, I mean Frank and Chris and Jim, everybody, like 33% across the board. You could have protected Matt Ryan and said, banged up, really banged up, um, probably not going to practice this week. If he doesn't, Sam Ellinger is going to go. Yep. And then next week you can kind of do the, hey, we'll see if Matt can give it a go. He's starting to feel a little bit better if he practices. He'll have a chance, and then you play kind of the questionable card. You get like two or three weeks into it, and you you defend Matt Ryan with an injury and not defend him. They, they did not defend Matt Ryan. They just said he got benched Yeah, regardless of injury. Like with Peyton Manning in Denver, I think when Peyton got banged up there and Osweiler played for a few of those games, yeah, I think Peyton probably could have gutted it out, but they looked at it and said, hey, man, you're banged up. We don't want to come out and say that we got to go with a different QB. This is what we we are going to do here. 
Um, I thought the Colts could have done in that manner. They didn't, and why? Because I think it's Jim Mercer putting his foot down and saying, nope, this is what we're going to do. I'd be interested to see if they make a trade here in the next you know, 24, 36 hours if Ballard does, in fact, speak after, depending on who the player is, right. if they do move a player. And again, the last trade we have seen, Eddie, for the Colts in season is yes. the one and only Trent Richardson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, a, a trade, I, I do think, would merit for him to meet the media. But I think he also knows deep down – if he meets the media to talk about a trade, then that means he's answering questions about his head coach. He's answering questions about his own job, and he just doesn't want to do that. Uh, Garrett is up next through Twitter questions. Um, he says, even though there haven't been a ton of penalties in the game yesterday, or there weren't a ton of penalties in the game yesterday, uh, does it feel as if all of them are wiping out big plays? Are the big plays happening because of the penalties? And does it speak to the decreased quality of of the offensive line this year. Thanks again, Kevin. Um, that's interesting. I guess I didn't really look at it like that. I mean, the Colts did benefit. Wasn't it a second and 22 that Campbell drew the huge penalty? Yep. So, I mean, there was a bit of a flip. I do think with Ellinger at quarterback, you got to be a little bit more conscious about like holding penalties when he starts to get out Yeah. and moving. Um, for some reason, I feel like the Nelson one could have been around that. I mean, Pryor had a false start. I, I I guess that's not the most crippling. Uh, Pryor had a holding penalty when Ellinger scrambled for 21. Maybe that's the play I'm thinking of. Yep. And then Nelson's penalty came on a six-yard scramble by Ellinger. So, ironically enough, both penalties on Ellinger scrambles. And I mean, obviously, when you're looking at quarterback scrambles like that, yep. most of the times those hold come when right. the quarterback's avoiding a sack. Right. And I know for sure on the on the Nelson hold that he was. Yeah, so I, I, I do think that is something um, that is that is relevant. Uh, David says, if the Colts were to be sellers uh, by the trade deadline, is that smart when evaluating Ellinger? Uh, the Stars did not do their job, which is why the Colts lost, aside from horrendous play calling. But I think we would be doing him no favors if we sell and put him in a worse situation. To be frank, he looked really good, but if we did sell, uh, what do you think would be possible to get in return for Quentin Nelson and Ryan Kelly? Uh, Q was bullied and has not been the same since 2019 or 2020, I guess. Uh, Kelly has been a train wreck, too, and seems frustrated with the team with the constant quarterback carousel reading in between the lines on his small comments from last week. Thanks, Kevin. Well, thank you, David, for that. You know, one thing I love about the podcast, Eddie, is you can explain yourself. Yep. And you have a lot of time, too. Uh, I think people saw my article last week on the trade deadline and, like, saw how I teased the tweet about, like, hey, I think the Colts should be open to selling. And they think selling is blowing it up. Oh, yeah. And I'm not saying that. Selling to me is one to two pieces. It's being very open-minded to everybody on your roster and saying that we're in a standpoint right now where no one is untouchable. Everybody has a price. Um, I think back a couple years ago to when TJ Warren suffered, I think, the start. I think it was the start of the foot issue. Uh, He was ruled out for the year like the day before the trade deadline or the day of. And at that point, the Pacers had been spiraling down this path. And at that point, I thought to myself, okay, you have got to admit to your franchise, guys, this year is not the year. We're not going to be able to make a run. And so then you look at a guy like Justin Holiday, you look at a guy like Doug McDermott and see veterans that shoot the ball really well and think, man, if we can move them and get a nice pick in return for them, that's going to help our team. Yeah. And the Pacers did not do that then. They were still kind of holding on to that previous group, and eventually they decided to go in a different direction. Again, in a way, and I know the NBA and the NFL is not apples to apples, but I feel that way about the Colts right now. Eddie, you got a 14% chance to make the playoffs. So if you play out the season eight times, you're making it one out of eight. And... You're going on the road the next two weeks. Then you've got the undefeated Eagles in your building. You look at December, you know, it's Cowboys, it's Vikings, it's the Chargers, the Giants. Bears, oh my. To start. Um, like, that. I just think that, you know, if the Colts were to be sellers, is that smart when evaluating Ellinger? 
I mean, I'm not acting like you're selling the entire offense. I mean, hell, Sam Ellinger's probably worked with Danny Pinter more than Ryan Kelly. Yeah. Who's to say Danny Pinter's not an upgrade right now? So that's how I view it. Obviously, what are you going to get in return for Kelly? Are people going to take Kelly? I mean, that, that would probably be a question that you would have as well. Uh, but certainly a team like Tampa, who's got... Yeah, fine, yeah. desperate teams. Yeah. Teams that are banged up right now. So uh, that is something that I would I would be looking at. Did uh, He did not play a snap. Who? Pinter. Right. Which was a little odd because, you know, you saw Ryan Kelly from the back watching Pinter take some... First team reps before During the games. Yeah, yeah, I know. Mike M- Mike Chapel observed that next to me, and yeah, that was that was interesting. Uh, Cameron and Turner or Tanner ask a very similar question, and they both say, "Hey, Kevin, uh, been a minute since a we've sent in a question, but still listen regularly." I love it. Uh, uh, what happened to Quentin Nelson? Excuse my language, but he's gotten his ass whooped lately. Is this just a product of a bad offensive line group? I'll give credit to Darren Payne. He's a great player, but I didn't expect him to struggle as much as he has recently. Yeah, you know, part of me is like, is this general wear and tear? You know, he's had the three surgeries in about a year span. Not this past year, but the year before that. Um, do we see that there? I, I don't. Quentin Nelson does not strike me as a guy that signs a contract and gets complacent. But, you know, is there just a human element of like, you know, a little bit of that seeps into you. Again, he doesn't strike me as that guy, but I think you at least have to ask it. But he has not been anywhere close to generational. And that's what you're paying him to be. You're paying him to be generational. Yep. This year he has not performed like that, and it's hurting the entire group. We had Jeff Saturday on today, and he and he mentioned that. You know, we, when you send Nelson that money, you're saying we need you to be an all-pro. And he has not been like that. You know, he might get on name recognition, but um, – yeah, Jeffrey Simmons, Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne. I mean, they're all good talents. Don't get me wrong; those are all first-round picks. But you just expect more from Nelson. And some of the whiffs and some of the, you know, on his ass, it's happening when it's not those guys. And I think that's what adds to it. Um, uh, next question is from John, and it's another offensive line-related question. Uh, he asks. How much of the offensive line issues do you think are personnel versus how much of it is coaching? I.e., if this was a Bill Belichick or Andy Reid staff, what would the variance in offensive line performance be? It's a good question. I think it's more personnel regression than anything. I do. I, I think there's a level of complacency, but I think it's basically you thought the left tackle and right guard did not need competition. And your depth, just in general, you didn't really pay much attention to it compared to past off seasons. Um, and then I think, I would say Braden Smith a little bit, but definitely with Kelly and Nelson, we have seen some regression there. So I, I would I put it more on the personnel. Uh, three questions left. This is from Grady. He says, "Hey Eddie, love what you have brought to the pod with KB." Let's go, Grady. I would agree with that. I appreciate the kind words. Is that um, your burner. No, no, I promise. <laughs> I am not Kevin Durant. Um, if you were a general manager of the Indianapolis Colts uh, leading up to the trade deadline, what moves would you do personally? I'd listen to pretty much any offer for a player at a low-value position. Yes, DeForest Buckner. Yes, Jonathan Taylor. And yes, Shaquille Leonard. I'd also bring back... <laughs> Scott Tolzien, no, um, it's time to suck for Bryce Young. Love the pod from Toronto. Grady, north of the border, thank you for that. Um, I think Curtis Painter may be able to play too. Yeah, I know. Tolzien, boy, I'm, I mean, that's just kind of been hanging fruit. I've certainly done it. You need picks for trade packages. You know, I've had a lot of people tweet at me like, you know, picks are no guarantees. I'm not saying you're utilizing all the picks. You can take those picks and, again, package them, and that's enticing to other teams. And that's the ability to move up. And then, of course, you can support your quarterback if you aren't utilizing all those picks. Something I thought about yesterday, Eddie, Taylor Heineke's keeping his job, right, when Carson Wentz gets back? You'd have to assume so, right? So that second-round pick is definitely becoming a third-rounder. We're going to have Dane Brugler 
draft analyst on the show tomorrow. That's our morning show, Kevin and Query, at 9.30 Eastern time. I'll probably throw that. Let's throw that on the Wednesday pod, Eddie. Yep. The Brugler interview. Yeah. Um, we will take an early look at the 2023 draft class. Um, I think it's relevant. I think the fact that they've benched, I've been thinking, like, when should we do that? Should we do it? I think when you bench Matt Ryan, it's time to do it. So we're going to have Dane Brugler on tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll t- toss that on here. Um, I guess just summarize my last thoughts because I think I've, talked a lot about selling and trade deadline. Yeah, yeah. Eddie, you and I did it on last week's pod, but this is kind of the final time to talk about it before it. You're right now you're tenth place in the AFC. See si, senor. Tenth. Um amidst of the two road games, you're basically three games back to the Titans. Like are people really going to be that upset if thirty two year old Stefan Gilmore is not here for the final five games and you net a third round pick out of it? It's not like Gilmore's part of your plans 2025 um like those are the guys and jmb and i our afternoon host kind of got into it he's like oh you can't do that to your fan base you can't you can't tell them that you're tanking like they should get refunds on their tickets i I mean part of it is just kind of professional sports yep and again ryan kelly at center versus danny pinto at center is that really going to be the difference between you showing up at lucas oil and not or Stephon Gilmore playing? It, it, I mean, Gilmore... I get Gilmore a little bit. Has been better, but yeah. Um, and look at the final four home games. Undefeated Eagles, Monday Night Steelers, Monday Night Chargers. I think those three games alone will just carry like entertainment hype yeah, um, juice that yeah. naturally I would want to go to. You know, Houston end the year, probably not. But <laughs> your next three home games are going to go there. Uh, two questions left. This is from John, but quick note before that: uh, NFC East, uh, Dow- uh, Eagles seven and zero, Cowboys six and two, Giants six and two, Commanders now four and four after yesterday's win. Uh, they're a combined twenty three and eight, and that's a winning percentage of seventy four percent, seventy four point two for specific purposes here. That is the highest combined winning percentage for a division through eight weeks since the merger in nineteen seventy. Per Elias Sports. Dude, talk about something I didn't see at the start of the year. No kidding. Right? And the Colts still play three of those teams. Yeah. <laughs> you got Washington out of the way. Bad news, you lost. Now you got the other three. And they're fourth in their division. <laughs> Home uh, to the Eagles, at the Cowboys, and at the Giants. I'll tell you what, Cowboys at Jerry's World are... Sunday night football, right? First week of December? Uh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, John says, I love the pod and listen to every episode. John, let's go. I didn't see a drop-off really at quarterback uh, yesterday, but Chris Strasser is at the helm of the single largest regression of an NFL unit in history. And how does he have a job, any job? Yeah, again, I I do think it is more personnel-driven, but to John's point, I mean, when you have taken a step back like that, I'm almost surprised he still has a job. Yeah, I, I figured he'd be next on the list. I mean, you know, at, at some point, either the personnel's the issue or the coach is the issue, or a little bit of both. And you know, he's what he's been the position coach since was it nineteen? Yeah, he took over for Gouge in nineteen. Yeah, I mean, it's there's been high moments early on. I would say Anthony Costanzo's presence probably helped you out there. And who knows? Did you know? Did he have a lot of belief in prior to left tackle to? You know, Pinto at right guard and not wanting as much depth as the Colts had last year. Those are probably questions you got to ask yourself. So, um, I'll end with this. We got one more question. Oh, we got one more? Yeah. All right, go ahead and ask it. And then I know um, some people are curious just about those Jim Irsay comments I want to double back on. Um, Hillary sent this question in this morning we discussed earlier. Uh, she says, what's the deal with Carly Ursay on the sidelines? Looks like she has the playbook and is listening in on the play calling. How much influence do you think the Ursay daughters have on the team's direction now? Yeah, Carly Ursay is there every game on the sidelines. You can't miss her. And in the locker room. She um, she rocks some outfits that, that certainly you, you cannot miss her. Uh, training camp for those that are at Grand Park, you would have seen her there on the sidelines. I think she is... She's trying to learn more and more about you know the inner workings of the football operations of it, the positional coaching conversations, coordinator conversations. So it makes sense to me. I mean, you know, at some point you are going to 
have to pass that torch. And of the three daughters, she is the one most active. She's the oldest, Casey Ursay Foyt, um, the middle daughter, Kaylin Ursay, who's the big and the kicking the stigma. I have always been very impressed by Kaylin. I think she should have a really front and center role. Um, continue to have it, and I would grow that if if possible. But those just kind of my thoughts on it. Uh, but yeah, Carly's there every game. I assume yeah, she's listening to the headset and you know that you know Ballard. You see him in the press box. He's got his earpiece in. I'm sure he's listening to some of those conversations and. Uh, yeah, it's not like she is. I think she is simply in a learning role. Like, soak it all in. And I don't think she is hopping on the mic and saying, whoa, no sneak here on third and goal? As much as you probably should. <laughs> I, I don't believe she's doing that. Uh, your final thoughts and uh, kind of recap Ursay's comments? Yeah, again, I just I, I don't read into anything Ursay said yesterday as Frank Reich and Chris Bauer will 1,000% be back next year. Safe in late October is not safe in early January. And he said those comments before yesterday. Yesterday on the Ursay meter, outside of Wentz being under center or Daniel Snyder playing yesterday and scoring a <laughs> touchdown, <laughs> that ranks pretty high up there. You think they met, shook hands, exchanged pleasantries? Blow a two-score lead in your own building, backup quarterback, with your greats in the building, Wentz, Snyder. I take that as a no. Don't believe they had pleasantries. I credit Ursay for having. I guess you're down at halftime. You can't really say anything, but he did have the mic at halftime. I was curious if he would drop anything. He 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 did not. Yeah, he did not. But his football team certainly dropped the ball in the fourth quarter for him. Uh, Seventeen uh, yeah. sixteen. Again, the Commanders win three four and one. We'll see what the next twenty four thirty six hours bring. Eddie Garrison, anything else? Uh, nope. Not for me. Go go Pacers. Patriots week. Go Pacers. Benedict Mather and Halliburton and Mather and just whisper it to yourself. Build. Early, early look at the weather in Foxborough looks gorgeous. Wait till um as Joe Wright said, he he swears that uh Bill Belichick has a, a like a meter or something on the weather and can control it or something along those lines. So uh I'd be on the lookout for the weather to change by then. That is spoken like a true, true Indie native Joe writes with plenty of venom for uh, the old evil empire. All right, everybody have a great week. We'll talk to you Wednesday.